Earlier this week, I released a podcast with ETOH talking about their whiskey reactor. I got a secret to tell you guys. It was a, uh, a ruse, a trick to see if we could steal their techniques and apply it to force aging home distilled products. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is Still It. And the truth of the matter is, I couldn't really steal their secrets because uh, they were completely open and shared everything <laughs> about their process, which was absolutely amazing of them. Uh, if you haven't seen that podcast, I thoroughly recommend you do it. You can watch it here on YouTube or on all the other podcatchers. Anyway, that's not what this video is about. This video is about taking what I learned in that podcast and seeing if I could apply it to home distilling, to what people can do in their own sheds. But it's my experience that any time you talk about a technique or a practice or a way of making a spirit that uh, goes against the, the tradition, you need to treat a little carefully for a few different reasons. One is that, I mean, it's tried and true and proven that the old traditional way of doing stuff is just, it works, right? Uh, and number two is that a lot of people, it, it's almost, a religious experience to them, and I mean that in a complimentary way, not in a in a bad way. People just love the process of how whiskey is made, and I get that. I'm one of those people. So before we go any further, I want to get a couple of disclaimers sorted from the beginning. Number one is I've always found it a little bit tricky to talk about the two sides of aging. I've talked about it in terms of oak tea bagging and real age in the past. Uh, Johan and Tobias from ETOH talked about it in terms of extraction and transformation. Awesome, How like that just sums it up in one go, right? I think I'm gonna talk about it in these terms from now on. If you haven't heard this discussion or this argument before, essentially what it's saying is, it's easy to extract flavors out of oak and stick it into a solution. Our solution being a spirit. You just dial up the amount you're putting in and you reduce the surface area and you can do it almost instantly. If you really wanted to, you could put a whole buttload of oak dust into spirit and you're done, Bob's your uncle. That is not aging. The aging process has another side to it where it takes the spirit and the stuff that it pulls out of the oak and it transforms those things into something magical, which is the, the lifeblood of the spirit that we love so much. So to truly represent a aging process, you're gonna to have to do both. You're gonna to have to extract and you're gonna to have to transform. I do also want to talk about my thoughts on the effectiveness of forced aging, does it have a place, what it's useful for, and so on and so forth. But, you know, YouTube algorithm, short attention spans. Let's get stuck into the, uh, the actual process that I did right now, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the video. I mention it now though, because if you're one of those people that's warming up your keyboard, ready to start typing about how this sort of thing has no place, and that it's just not as good, if you're one of those people, just chill, hold your horses and wait until you hear what I say about this at the end because uh, we might actually be on the same page. Chances are you're gonna be on the same page as today's sponsor as well, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community made up of teachers that are actually practicing what they preach. It's curated specifically for learning, which means there's no ads and things like that popping up to distract you. And they are always launching new premium classes so you can take your learning where you want it to go. Skillshare offers membership with meaning, connect with other fellow creatives and enter a community of encouragement, communication and inspiration. I've been watching YouTube success by Marquez Brownlee and let's face it guys, if you've seen MKBHD's videos before, you know he's an absolute master of the platform. It is pretty freaking cool that I can hone my craft, my career, by learning from people of that caliber. In fact, I think he's really helped me lift my video production over the last six months or so. The first 1,000 Stillit subscribers that click the special link in the description down below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. I mean, let's face it guys, you can cram a whole lot of learning into one month. So I took three jars that are uh, properly sealable. Yes, I get it, they're not ideal for, you know, safety, so on and so forth. Not the point of this video, the point is to see if I can get something to work. I filled each of those jars with 250 mils of whiskey. This is the same whiskey that I used in the last little sort of forced age testing video. Uh, and I did that on purpose. I saved it for this video to compare apples with apples later on. 
I also added exactly the same oak in as we used last time, a measured amount, exactly 11 grams per jar. And here's the kicker guys, uh, once again, according to what the guys at ETOH are doing, I added a little bit of acid into each of these jars. More on that in a second. One jar got vinegar or acetic acid, the second got tartaric acid, and the third got citric acid. It was a half gram per jar, almost nothing. You'll notice that I've set this up so each of the jars has quite a lot of headroom, that's important, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, and I gave each jar a really, really good shake before the first step, which was to go into a ultrasonic cleaner for 12 hours set at 65 degrees Celsius. After the ultrasonic cleaner, it was put into a water bath controlled with a sous vide machine and held at 65 degrees for another three days. I should mention too that at every step of this process, doesn't matter if it was in the sous vide machine or the ultrasonic bath, uh, I came out to the shed and gave it a really good shake twice a day. Anyway, after the three days in the sous vide machine at 65 degrees, I uh, opened it up. This was the only time I opened the sample during the whole thing. Gave it a quick taste test to see if it was over oaked at this point. None of them were at this point in the process, so they all went back into the ultrasonic cleaner at 65 degrees for another six hours. Why did I do all of these things and what do we hope to accomplish by doing them? This is essentially gonna be the part of the video where I summarize everything that we talked about on the podcast. But once again, guys, if you, if you haven't listened to that and you are a whiskey distilling geek, you really need to go listen to it. Anyway, here we go. Number one is the ultrasonic cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaners work through a process or a, a concept of cavitation. The sonic energy goes through the liquid on the outside, in this case that's just water for me, and the liquid inside the jar, in our case obviously that is the, the whiskey, uh, and it is going to cause gaps, and those gaps are going to turn into bubbles, and those bubbles are going to cavitate, which basically means they collapse back in on themselves. This gives almost a like a physical shaking, moving, agitation kind of effect on the, the product in there. So for us, that's the wood. But it also gives us insanely high temperatures on a very localized, like tiny little scale. Both of those things are gonna help with extraction, getting flavors, getting chemicals, getting stuff out of the wood and into the whiskey solution. But it's also gonna help with transformation. Now here's the thing, the team at ETOH can actually, I guess, tune their ultrasonic machine. They can dial it in to focus or act on certain molecules or chemicals more than others. We don't have that ability with a little ultrasonic cleaner. So in some ways, we're just kind of shooting in the dark here and hoping it's gonna work out. But we have had reports from a bunch of different people like Bearded and Board saying that yes, this does have a effect on whiskey. Number two, heat. It's a pretty standard, assumption, I guess you would call it, in chemistry, that if you raise the, the temperature, the rate of the reaction is going to increase as well. The kinetic energy, by definition, of the reactants is going up. The interaction between the reactants, because of that, is going to go up as well. And while I can't prove, and I do not believe that ETOH are claiming that every single reaction inside a barrel is going to be affected in this way, I don't think you can say that, but I do think it's a fairly safe assumption that a good proportion of those reactions are gonna be affected in this way. Tobias and Johan specifically suggested 65 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature that they work at. Number three is oxygenation and oxidization. And this has been a talking point in, I mean, damn near anything that you're gonna age in a barrel for a long time. Barrels will allow whatever is inside them to slowly oxidize. That's just the way it is. For whiskey and rum, this is gonna give the, impression or the, 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 the sensation of an older spirit, that roundness, that completeness, that sort of gentling and mellowing of the spirit. This is the reason that I left a really large amount of headspace in the jar. Now, if I had the equipment, I would be doing it the same as the guys at ETOH, but I cannot introduce a specific amount of oxygen over a specific amount of time without letting everything else out of the jar. So instead, what I decided to do is leave a decent amount of headroom and just give it a shake every now and again to reintroduce that oxygen into the spirit. And lastly, the thing that you're probably most intrigued about is the acid. The process of esterification can add a whole lot to a whiskey. And to create esters, we need a alcohol. We've got plenty of that. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, and we also need a carbolic acid. 
Fermentation will give us alcohol, obviously, <laughs> but it will also give us some of those organic acids as well. We can also get them out of the barrel through the process of maturation. This is something that's happening naturally in a whiskey or a rum anyway, but by adding specific acids in, I guess we can kind of tweak things in the direction we want. A specific acid and a specific alcohol will create a specific ester. And different combinations of each will create different esters which will give different flavour profiles and aromas. Here are all the samples we're going to be testing uh, and really quick I just wanted to say that I've messed up a little bit. Uh, so you can probably see that some of these samples are quite cloudy actually and as these came off the whole aging process that I had over there with the ultrasonic bath they were super super cloudy and the same thing actually happened uh, a little while ago with the hot cold sample I had here. As it sat over about four or five days they cleared out substantially uh, and this one is now damn near crystal clear uh, but when I picked them up and moved them over here I shook them up all over the place and now they're a little cloudy. Take that into account. Anyway so what we have here guys is the tartaric acid version, the vinegar or acetic acid version and the citric acid version along with the hot cold version that I did uh, a little while ago. I'll link that video up here. It is exactly the same spirit, as it, exact, it is exactly the same wood, it is just a different process and it hasn't had any extra acid added into it. All right let's get stuck in shall we? Tartaric acid first of all. Yeah so this one has a lot of the original whiskey flavour to it. It's still it still has a lot of that caramel warm fudge kind of thing going on that was quite predominant in the uh, in the white dog from this whiskey. The oaks come out in this a whole lot and to be fair comparing it to the hot cold version which I guess is kind of the almost like a control not really but it's what I'm going to compare everything else against. Comparing it to that there is definitely more of a straight oak presence to this. Okay so now this one is actually presenting slightly tangy which is surprising to me because uh, right after I dosed all of these at the beginning I tasted them because I wanted to see if the amount of acid I was putting into them was enough to be registrable to be tasteable by my senses and I couldn't taste it. Interesting. It's not straight up acidic it's not over the top but it is it is just a touch tangy. <coughs> that went down the wrong hole. Oh god don't breathe while you're drinking whiskey. <laughs> the vinegar one. Oak profile is almost identical I would say it's very very similar. Mmm okay what this one has is a very interesting pear like flavour to it. Flavour and aroma actually now that I've tasted it. Totally. Just orchard fruit in general, there's a, a big complex fruity characteristic to it but it focuses specifically on pears. Uh, once again a lot more extraction in terms of wood compared to this one. All right the citric acid. The malts come through on this a lot. This one smells like Milo. I don't know if you've had Milo. The Kiwis and the Ockers they will know exactly what I'm talking about. For everyone else, man, I don't know, like a malt milkshake, I guess? I don't even know if that's a thing or the same thing outside of New Zealand. That really smells quite interesting. This one is a little acidic as well, but not nearly as acidic as this. Is it a function of the extraction from the wood? Maybe? I don't know. The citric acid version definitely does not have the uh, pear flavour that this one does though. It does have, sitting under the, the, the Milo, just more of a general fruitiness than definitely these two. And let's taste the, the one from last time. Keep in mind guys that this went through a different process but it's also been sitting in this jar for a decent amount of time now. So it's had the, uh, the benefit of actual age. I, I don't know how long, I'll figure it out and put it up here so you know how old it is uh, at the point of tasting this. I prefer the oak profile on this. It is more subdued, it is less clubbing you over the head. None of these are peppery, none of these are astringent, none of them are spicy, but for the style of spirit it is. Just purely on a stylistic approach I would like slightly less wood in it. The wood profile on this is on point. But the finish still wants to fight me a whole lot more than these. It's not bad, it's not over jaggy, but this especially, especially the vinegar one, is mellow and rounded. 
that presents like a much older whiskey. The general wood flavor and overall flavor profile of this with some of the Milo and some of the pear with the finish of these two. That would be where it needs to go. <laughs> and that I think is going to tie into what I was talking about before in terms of me sharing my specific thoughts on how any sort of process like this can be, uh, can be used. Here we go. I feel like I need to spell this out because people seem to keep misinterpreting what I'm saying about all of this force aging stuff. No, I have yet to find a single force aged product, commercial, homemade or otherwise, that is as good as other commercial whiskies I've had. But I have yet to have a homemade whiskey in general that is as good as some of the commercial whiskies I've had. That doesn't mean we should stop trying. In addition to that, it is just a tool. You can't judge the effectiveness of the tool purely by tasting the products that some people make with that tool. I guess what I'm trying to say is what would happen if we took ETOH's reactor and took it to Lefroig and made John Campbell experiment with it for a couple of months? I mean, <laughs> what about giving Rachel Barry a whole buttload of reactor aged spirits to mess around with and blend together. Do you get what I'm saying here? Perhaps the problem with comparing reactor aged spirits to the very best whiskies out there on the market is the fact that we are comparing a tool against years and years and years of experience attached to the people that are literally the best in the world at doing this stuff. I'm not trying to defend it. I'm not trying to say it's amazing. I'm not trying to say it's bad. I'm just saying it's a tool. Like I said at the very beginning of the video, I love the traditional way of doing things, but I'm also a geek at heart and I like to kind of experiment and push things. In other words, I feel like perhaps there is an opportunity somewhere to do something with this speed age, four stage reactor that is going to make something as good as traditional whiskey someday. Perhaps not. Perhaps it is just a tool that can be used in other ways. This seems blatantly obvious to me when I compare the stuff that Tobias and Johan sent to me compared to the stuff that I've just made. Nothing I've made is a finished product yet. Nothing I've made I'm proud of. But it's interesting. It's interesting. Compare that to their stuff, which really is quite nice whiskey. It's not world class, but honestly, I don't, I don't think they themselves would expect it to be yet. So why do I think any of this is interesting and why do I think it's an interesting tool right now? Uh, number one is I think it's a really good teaching tool to help more people understand what's happening in a barrel. And if you understand more of that process, you have more control over the process, even if you are doing it the traditional way. Uh, number two is the reason that I use it most often is I think it's a really, really cool research and development tool. Maybe the final product you're going to make isn't going to be force aged, but if you can experiment and try a few different factors and variables in a matter of weeks and decide what you want to go with for the long run when you maturate something for years, I mean, there's an advantage to that. You have to admit that. Number three, I think it potentially could open up ways to build on tradition in really creative ways. And that that is where I see perhaps the industry taking this, as well as using it as a creative tool behind closed doors. I don't know what's possible. I don't know where that's going to go, but it's going to be very, very interesting to watch this over the next 15 to 20 years. Anything like this is going to take a while to become mainstream and be accepted in, a, in an industry like whiskey. And lastly, it's awesome because it's geeky and it's fun. If you're doing this as a hobby in your shed, don't listen to someone that says, oh, you have to do it this way because that'll make a better product in the end. Dude, if you want to make something and drink it four days later and that makes you happy because you get to geek out along the way, tell the other guy to get fucked. It's none of their business telling you what you need to do to enjoy your hobby. Do it your way. Okay, rant over, I'm done. <laughs> I need to say a big, big thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons. I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate everything you do for me. I thoroughly appreciate their support. Thank you so much, guys. All right, let's talk really quickly about putting all of this in perspective. So out of these four spirits, which one would I prefer to drink right now as it is? Probably this one. It's the most balanced. I enjoy it the most right now. This one is a very close second. These two have very nice qualities. 
uh, both in terms of the actual spirit sitting in front of me and in terms of piquing my interest for what could happen in the future. So I don't want anyone going away from this thinking that any of these things are amazing. I don't want anyone leaving thinking any of these things are complete and utter shit. The point of these kinds of experiments for me is not to make something amazing straight away. It's to give myself an excuse to keep experimenting with it. It is to, it's, it's just a proof of concept, right? So does this type of technique work? 100%. Can it make something that is as good as a 10 year old scotch in six days? I haven't. <laughs> I haven't done it, obviously, and I need to play with a bunch more variables. The guys at ETOH got a whole lot closer. I couldn't fault their spirit for being young though. I couldn't fault their spirit for being young, but compared to you know my other favorite whiskies, no, I don't think it was as good, but there's a bunch of really good commercial spirits on the, on the market that I would say the same thing about, right? What am I gonna do differently when I try this again? Uh, I would double down on the vinegar and the citric acid. Those seem to turn out a whole lot better. I would reduce the ratio of wood to alcohol, and I would extend the heating period in the middle, potentially even uh, removing the wood before going back into the ultrasonic bath to try and bump up that transformation side of things while keeping the uh, extraction the same or even slightly lower for this style of spirit. I think that's what I would do. But uh, if you have an idea on how you think you could change the variables up to get a superior result, or if you're already doing it, please guys, chuck it in the comment section down below. But if you enjoyed the video guys, please, please, Give it a thumbs up, that really does help me out a whole lot. Drop a comment in the comment section down below if you have something to say, and, and, catch you next time guys. Keep interested in the craft. See ya.